All right, so Alpine.js, a little bit about me. I am the owner and director of South of Shasta Consulting. It is a developer consultancy business based here in Sacramento. Um, I slash we work on a variety of web and mobile stuff. It varies from client to client, but we've done projects with Adobe, NASA, Turnitin, OpenTable, Zendesk, a variety of state agencies, a variety of training companies, uh, all kinds of stuff. Obviously, I manage the SAC Interactive Tech Meetup that we're watching here. Uh, I used to program video games a long time ago, and uh, that was super fun, but a lot of work and not nearly enough money. Uh, so I switched to the web quite some time ago, and I'm uh, what I would call a music junkie. I'm willing to bet that I spend more time and money on concert tickets and vinyl records than the rest of you combined. Uh, my house looks like this. I have vinyl records and CDs and stuff pretty much everywhere. I'm quite proud of my record collection. Um, all of the code and slides from today's presentation will be at that GitHub repo. Uh, it's not live, it's not public right now, but if you want to just go ahead and like take a screenshot of that URL and that GitHub repo name, you can go there later and grab all the code demos and all the slides and everything that I have. Uh, so that way, if you're not a fast typer, you don't have to take a bunch of notes while we're doing the presentation today. You can just sit back and watch and go to that link later and grab everything. So Alpine.js, uh, Alpine.js has been described and is also, it's also their tagline where they say it is jQuery for the modern web. Uh, the syntax and problems that Alpine solves are similar to the way Vue.js works. Um, we'll get into some of those similarities and things in, uh, in the presentation. There's no build step required for Alpine. So if you're used to like React or Angular where you have to compile all of your TypeScript and stuff together and then load that bundle up into the browser and there's that additional step in uh, putting everything together from like React or whatever. Uh, that step is not part of Vue.js. Vue.js is more like jQuery in that you have a script tag, you include your, not jQuery JS file, but your Alpine JS file, and that's all you have to do. You can start using it. Uh, so there's no node or NPM packages you have to install or anything like that either. It's literally just one vanilla JS file. Uh, Alpine is very lightweight and simple to use by design. It is not trying to replace the great big crazier frameworks like React and that sort of thing. It's solving a different type of problem. Uh, like I said before, it's one JavaScript file. It does very few things. It has 15 attributes, six properties, and two methods. Um, the stuff you build with Alpine really is more of an Alpine component, not a full-blown front-end application like you would get with Angular or React or something like that. Um, it's better for... When you have a web page and you want to have a little bit of extra fancy interactivity in one particular portion of the page, like this one div on the right-hand column, or if you need to add search functionality to one part of the page or something like that, uh, Alpine is great for that sort of thing. If you have a larger site with lots of front-end stuff and you need to have route-style syntax, like what I have highlighted on my screen right there, um, it's better to use something like React Review, the full-blown front-end uh, framework. Alpine may not be the solution you're looking for. But if it is, I think it's great. Um, most of the projects we're doing at my consultancy business now, um, unless we have a client requirement that says this needs to be React or this needs to be Vue, everything we're doing is vanilla JavaScript web components, which are vanilla JavaScript, and um, Alpine.js. Um, so uh, with jQuery, if you've used jQuery before, you have the dollar sign selector where you can say dollar sign and then the, in the parentheses put an HTML tag name, a class, an ID, whatever your selector is for anything on the entire web page, whether it's at the very top line or bottom line, you can select whatever you want with jQuery and then do jQuery stuff to it. With Alpine, it's a little bit more like a view template where you have like a div tag or something and you give that div tag an ID and say, this is the view Everything inside this div tag is going to be Vue.js stuff that happens there. It's not the entire page. It's, you know, from the opening of this div to the closing or whatever. Uh, Alpine is very similar to Vue in that regard. And with that, let's take a look at the Hello World demo and show you what that looks like. So here's my basic Hello, Nolan Erk. Welcome to your first Alpine app. I'm going to make that larger so you can see what we have. There we go. And I'll load that up here in the browser. And here's our first Alpine.js app. Most of this is standard vanilla HTML. Everything 
up there is generic HTML, nothing Alpine related at all. You can see I'm um, I'm including the Alpine JS file. And I have this div here in the middle where I say div x dash data. I've got some stuff in there. And I have a little bit of mostly generic HTML inside there too. Uh, this is my Alpine JS component. That x data thing there is what specifies that this div tag will be an Alpine thing. Um, and then I say x data. And in curly braces, I simply add whichever um, properties and the values for them I want into um, my Alpine component. And then I can use them here in the contents of that component. So you can see I've got first name and last name set to two different values. And here I have a span tag. And I can say x text, x text is equal to first name, which would be Nolan. And then the x HTML version is equal to last name. And you can see my last name value has some HTML inside it right there. We'll take a look at those in just a second. When I go back here to the browser, you can see, in fact, it does load up how you expect it to. Nolan is in plain text and Irk is in uh, bold. If I go back here, you'll see that this first one we're using X text is drawing the plain text thing. And we use X HTML when you want to draw the HTML um, type of content out to the screen. I don't have to have HTML tags in there for it to be um, for me to use this uh, operator. I can go back there and reload it. And of course, it'll load plain text just fine. But I cannot do the opposite of that. If I go over here and in first name, try to do that, you can see that it will escape out the HTML. Similar to those kind of operators in Angular and all the other tools as well. It's just a security thing. You want to make sure you're only loading dynamic HTML in parts of your app that you're expecting to load dynamic HTML to cut down on security issues. So let me move that back here. All right, and then we just have regular plain text out the other side. Back here, all right. Uh, so like I said before, xData, that's where all of your Alpine variables live. It's really where all of your everything Alpine lives is in that xData equals block of stuff that where you can define your variables there. If you have event handlers, um, if you need to listen for Alpine things, like when Alpine first initializes and loads, if you have ad hoc methods of your own that you want to put in your component, you can put all those in that xData thing. Everything that makes up your Alpine component goes in that xData block, similar to um, the new view operator. If you're building like a view component and you're dropping that inline somewhere in a larger, like a .php file or something. Uh, you can have conditional logic in Alpine, of course. You've got two options for that, x show and x if. If you use x show to toggle something on and off, it's a hide show kind of mechanism. That means the thing you're hiding or showing still exists in the DOM. It's just hidden um, behind the scenes. Alpine just adds the CSS display hidden or invisible, whatever it is, um, to your component so that it's not on the screen anymore. And if you use the x if syntax, it actually does add or remove that thing from the DOM. It's not just hidden with CSS anymore. Um, if you want to do the add remove thing with xif, you have to actually use the template tag and have one root element inside that template tag uh, for it to work. And with that, let's take a look at some of those things. Conditionals look like this. Most of this is the same as it was before. Here's my xdata, open div, and closed div. So everything here is my Alpine component. I've got a couple of properties inside here, musician name, instrument, and age. And you can see I have um, my H1 is just getting set to musician name. So that should be John Lennon on the screen when we load the page in the browser. And then down here, I have a div. Um, and I just have X show equals instrument. So if instrument is not empty, if it's actually got a value in it of some sort, then it will show this paragraph tag on the inside with that instrument property displayed um, inside of there with X text. All of the Alpine things you'll do in your HTML, they all begin with this X dash syntax, X data, X text, X show, and so on. There are a couple of other things in Alpine that are not X dash. There was like a dollar sign for some of it and a couple other things. We'll look at those a little bit as well towards the end of this presentation. And then down here, I've got the X if syntax. And like we saw on the slide, it does have to be a template tag. You have to have one parent or root node element inside it. If I had like that div and then below it, I'd have a P tag as well. Um, it'll render on the screen, but it'll render incorrectly. So you wanna make sure that you wrap everything in one 
root element like we have here. And if I go back here to my browser, load it up, you can see there's my H1, John Lennon. John plays guitar, and he's old enough to enter the club, which was the optional syntax based on our X if thing here. If age is greater than 21, age is 64, so that's true. So it does, in fact, load this div and add it to the DOM on the screen. Up here, we're using the X show, which just is the hide show CSS trick, and it draws it on the screen there. If I go into instrument and make that an empty string so that um, this is no longer true, and we load the page, you can see that that John plays guitar line um, is no longer visible. It's, uh, but if I inspect and go X data, you can see that it is in fact still there. It's just got the display none um, attached to it. So there's my conditionals. Attribute binding, uh, use a thing called xbind to do syntax like this, xbind colon, and then whatever the HTML attribute on your tag is that you want to dynamically add some Alpine, you know, magic to, you say Alpine um, equals what, or you say some, whatever your HTML value is, attribute, excuse me, set it to the value, uh, kind of like this. Image tag, you say X bind source, because you have the source attribute on an image tag, and then you give it the variable name instead of the actual path to your JPEG or ping or whatever. Um, some people don't like this syntax. It's a little verbose for some folks. You can replace, or you can get rid of the X dash bind part and just begin it with the colon and do this and get the exact same results. I don't like the shorthand syntaxes in Alpine. I generally use the longer form X dash prefixes on everything, even when it's optional. I just, I like the visual clue that everything that's X dash something is all Alpine stuff rather than having to guess do the things that begin with a colon mean something in Alpine or is that a typo? Are the things that begin with an at or a, you know, whatever else do those, are those Alpine specific or is that a typo or something else? I just like having it all be X dash bind, X dash if, all that stuff whenever possible. My personal take on it. I also type really fast, so the extra typing doesn't bother me. With that, let's load up our attribute binding demo and we'll take a look at that one. Attribute binding looks like this. All right, um, again, all just boilerplate stuff. Here's my X, uh, my Alpine component, X data. In this case, I've got two URLs that just point to uh, images from the slide deck that we saw earlier. I can say image X bind source goes to slide image URL one. And if I load that up, you get that image on the screen like we had uh, earlier. And then of course, if I change it back to, if I change it to slide image two, It'll use this image instead. And there's the other one. That's the same. That's the image from the previous slide. Uh, you can, of course, bind to basically any data attribute or any attribute in your HTML tags. It's not specific to source or image tags or anything like that. Just bind to whatever, whatever the attribute is, it's going to have the moving part that you want to be able to swap in and out at runtime while your component is doing something. Uh, loops. You can loop over everything with X4. Uh, you have to use the template tag with your looping construct. And just like the X if we saw earlier, um, you want to have one root item inside it. If you have two things inside your template for X4, it'll render, but incorrectly. So um, load that up and show you a demo of the first looping syntax. Here we go. I've got in this one, I've got an array of the Beatles. And I have my template tag, x4 person in Beatles. And I can just do x text equals person out on the screen there. And I should get uh, one, two, three, four, five div tags on the screen with my five Beatles in them. And there they are. Um, if you want to be able to do fancier things with the loop, like reorder the items and be able to click on you know the fourth thing and know that it's the fourth thing rather than just drawing random div tags to the screen like we did here. Then you can add this colon key operator like this. So I've got a slightly fancier um, array in here now. Instead of just their names, I've given each thing an ID number and 
um, these, these are structures now. So person and instrument are just keys inside the structure of each of the Beatles. And then so my, most of my loop syntax is the same as it was before. It's still a template tag. It's still an X4. Um, I'm looping over the Beatles array, putting things into B. This is the new part here. This colon key equals, and then we're just saying inside the each row in my array, it's called B. And then the thing inside that row, which is the ID property, that's the bit that we're going to use to loop over all of the individual items here in um, my output that this component is doing. And you'll notice that nowhere down here do I have that key syntax or the b.id thing being referenced anywhere. If I go render this, let's take a look at it. I think we can see behind the scenes. Um, where's it at? Uh, nope, I guess I have to go back and add something for that to it. But anyway, that's the syntax you would use. Um, if you want to be able to reorder your items later and, and do things we need to actually know, you clicked on the second item or the third item, um, use this key syntax here uh, on your loop, and that'll make that kind of functionality easier to deal with. All right, there's loops. Close this one. Forms and binding stuff. You've got uh, another Alpine thing called X model, um, where you can basically do similar binding to form elements like you would do in Angular or AngularJS. Um, it works on all of the types of form fields except type equals file. You cannot do this on a type equals file item. That is for security reasons. Uh, the idea with X model is I can write code that populates those form fields. It, populating the text box, no problem. Populating a checkbox, no problem. If I can populate a file item in a form with whatever code I want, I could theoretically put a line in there that says, please upload this person's you know personal files off of their laptop and then it gets uploaded behind the scenes kind of invisibly from the user um, and that could cause a lot of security problems for people so you cannot do type equals file all the other form field types it works just fine it's basically the same model view view model kind of binding you've seen in like angular js and that sort of thing and here's my form we'll take a look at the code for that this one's a little bit bigger but um yeah, here's all the important stuff on the screen. There's nothing above line eight that's Alpine specific. So I've got my data and I've got four div tags on the screen. These are the same as in our previous examples, just plain text using the X text operator to draw the contents of stuff on the screen. Here's the new stuff. We have some form fields down below and notice how this guitarist one, here's my input tag. I have the model set to guitar, which is that property there in my Alpine data. And this one has model set to vocals, bass and drums, which are the other three properties here in my data, right? And then these are just plain text outputs of those four same variables, guitar, vocals, bass, drums. If I go in here to the browser and I change the guitarist name to Eddie Van Halen, you can see that it automatically updated the other things on the screen that are bound to that property because the model updates the view and the view updates the model and it all just kind of happens um, seamlessly by Alpine, you know, without us having to do anything. <clears throat> so nothing crazy about that. Um, and again, we're just including that one Alpine JS file. It's the same .js file that I've used the entire time. We haven't had to turn any options on or configure anything. It just does these things when you start using it. All right, so there's my binding. Modifiers. Uh, modifiers I use so you can, any guesses, any guesses? Modify how your data is handled. Um, forget Alpine for a minute. Plain JavaScript has had a problem for decades where anything you put in a form field, JavaScript treats it like a string. Even if you put a number in there, like age, and you set age to 25, JavaScript by default thinks that's the characters to five. It does not think of it as the number 25. Um, and to solve problems along those lines in Alpine, Alpine comes with modifiers. Two of them are dot number and dot boolean that help make dealing with numeric and boolean data a little bit easier. It automatically converts the data to number or boolean um, <clears throat> rather than you having to write your own like two int conversion thing or 
worry about if someone put the word true in quotes or if they did not put the word true in quotes. So is it the string or is it the actual Boolean value? You just add these dot number and dot Boolean modifiers on and they'll work for you. We'll look at a demo of that in just a minute. Uh, you've also got debounce modifier, which basically lets you do things like if you're working on a search page and you want to slow down how quickly the model gets updated as people are typing things into the um, into the box. If you don't want to, you know, you want to make the app just look a little more smooth, you can add debounce and set the number of milliseconds on there for what you want to do. Uh, similar to debounce, you can set a throttle, um, same kind of syntax. You just set the, um, however many milliseconds you want before the throttling turns on or off and on. Uh, you can actually keep this dot five hundred ms part. That's optional. You can just say model dot debounce or model dot throttle. I'm sorry, x model dot debounce or throttle, um, and then it will default to I think it's two hundred or two hundred and fifty milliseconds for each of these. Um, let's take a look at the mod modifiers, and I'll show you how those in action. It's number seven. All right, so here's our app again with some of our data, and this time I have a string. I've got a number. I guess technically that's a string because it's in quotes. Uh, the important part here is I have a Boolean value, false, and notice false is not in quotes. It's just the actual Boolean value false. And then down here, I've got some Alpine stuff happening too. We have plain text on the screen for that guy. Uh, here's syntax we haven't seen yet. X show, and then we have if is walrus is equal to true, then draw the I am the walrus version on the screen. So this entire thing gets drawn if that part is true. And this entire thing gets drawn on the screen if that part is true, which is the opposite of that one. So you're going to have either this span or this span up here on the screen. And I've got my age uh, input down here. We're not going to do anything with that at the moment. Input is the same. Or I'm sorry, instrument is the same as what we saw earlier. Here's the fun part we're going to play with on this demo. Um, I've got my drop down to say whether John is or is not the walrus. And it's set to X model set to is walrus, which is that property up there. So anytime this dropdown is changed from yes to no or back again, this value gets updated. And that value is used on these two span tags. So you can go in here and load this up. And let me reload that at the beginning, just so you know I'm not lying to you. By default, it says he's not the walrus, and it says I'm not the walrus. Yes, that says I'm the walrus. Flip it back again the other way. Notice how I'm using the dot boolean modifier here. Notice how I do not have the word false in quotes up there. It is the actual boolean value false. Sometimes going from false in quotes to false not in quotes and back again, the truth and truthy and kind of truthy variable garbage we've had to deal with in JavaScript for 30 years. Um, if I did not include that modifier and load that page up again, it breaks because it's doing the comparison of the Boolean value true to the word T-R-U-E. And I don't want to deal with that garbage. So we put the modifier on there and then it works properly. And you'd have the same issue if we were doing math on this age property. If I tried to do like 64 plus, you know, if I had something down here that added a number to it, let's say it added 64 plus two, rather than that being set to 66, what I would get is I would get 642, right? Because it would just do string appending by default, instead of treating age like a number. So similar kind of problem, both annoying, uh, hence the modifiers that we have in Alpine to get around that. Close those down. All right. Uh, getters. Um, getters are for when you have a method that you've got some variables in your Alpine app, like the instrument and musician name that we saw earlier, for example. Uh, if you have a function that uses those variables, if those variables change to new values, that function will automatically update and refresh whatever parts of the page need to refresh where it was called. Um, it's similar to what they have uh, called computed properties in Vue.js, except in Vue, the computed properties are cached, and in Alpine, they are not cached. Um, the syntax looks like this. Uh, it's kind of hard to see in the slide, but there is a space between the word get and full name there. It's not get full name as one method name, it's full name. And there's that get um, keyword before it, um, letting, you know, letting you know that this is a get a getter method in Alpine. Technically, the get thing is not required. Um, I like adding it though, because I think it makes the app more self-documented. It makes it clear to me which of my methods are actual methods doing stuff and which of them are just the getters. 
um, for this kind of functionality. And with that, we'll load this up and take a look at one. And get it to look like this. So here's my X data. I've got a couple of properties in here, first name and last name. And you can see my getter is called full name. Down here in this div tag, I'm using the name of that getter method, just like I have previously used the names of these just regular properties in an X text thing. But here's the name of that guy. Because full name uses this first name and this last name, if either of those, or rather either of those, change during the lifespan of this app, and they might because we have X model things down here looking at them, then this method is going to automatically run again and again and again for each time that those change. And the output of whatever that return statement is will show up here in my div tag at the top. So with that, let's load that up and take a look. And here's my div tag, and here are the two tags down below it. I can change Eddie to, let me... I can change Eddie to Alex Van Halen, and it updates the stuff on the screen. It reran that get full name method um, automatically for me and updated that div. Uh, all I had to do is type new stuff into that text box because I'm using the model, and the model has those property names in it. And then those property names are called from inside my getter. It all just starts, sort of magically starts working. <clears throat> Um, events. So you've got your standard JavaScript events on click, on mouse over, on mouse down, on submit, all the usual stuff. Uh, you can still do events in Alpine. Use the X on syntax to dispatch events. It looks like this. Instead of just on click, you do X on colon click and then put your code in there to do whatever it is you want to do. Um, again, some people don't like the X on colon thing, you can shorthand that to just the at symbol and do at click like that. And this, whoops, this will do the exact same thing as this. Um, again, I don't like the shorthand syntax. I like using the X dash everywhere for consistency. That's my personal opinion. Um, but let's take a look at the events in action and see what they do. Number nine. Uh, this one's a super small Alpine component. Um, I have X data with nothing inside it. And inside there, I have a button with X on click. And when you click this button, it's going to run the alert method, just like it would in plain JavaScript. So there's nothing super fancy happening here. I run it. There's my hello world. Um, kind of a bonus tip in this example. See how our X data doesn't have anything in it at all? So we're just really typing these extra characters just for the Alpine syntax um, reason. I could technically do that too, since I don't have any stuff going into the X data uh, block for this particular component. There's no need to make me actually type out the extra stuff. I can just do that. Well, if we take a look at that one step farther, there's really no need for that entire div tag. All that div tag is doing is saying, the stuff inside here is an Alpine component, but there's only one stuff inside here. So you can actually combine X data onto the actual tag itself, when you have a one line or a single element component, you can actually combine those together like I have down here. Save yourself a little bit of typing. So now I have that. I've turned off the one up above. So I've got, I just put the X data mod of, um, attribute on the button itself rather than wrapping the button in a div tag and everything else is the same. And now if I reload the page, it'll still work the way it's supposed to. So that looks cool and all, but we've been putting a lot of HTML and logic and variables and things all kind of together in the same HTML files. And usually that's not what developers want to do. You want to have one file with all of your HTML view display stuff in it. And you want to have all your variables and moving parts that are business logic and, and stuff like that. You want to have those in a separate file. Uh, you can actually do that. It's no different than any other JavaScript framework in that regard. You can move all of your J JavaScript stuff over to a .js file. And instead of your X data attribute having a struct with a whole bunch of things inside it, you just put the name of whatever you want to call your, um, I said the app in here, but really you want to call it whatever the name of your Alpine JS component is going to be, you put that in there. 
and you'll refer to that in your block of JavaScript, similar to how you would do it with a view component. Um, I'll come back to this xcloak thing in just one second. Let's take a look at the separate files demo and we'll see that in action. So here's what a separate file thing looks like. Ten. I made a new folder for that one. Here's my app.js file and here's my index file and here's my CSS and we'll come back to that. So we'll start with the index file. Uh, again, nothing Alpine specific up there. The only difference down here is instead of our X data having that struct with, you know, the stuff in it that we had before, it's got just the plain text string of the app in there. And then everything down here is plain HTML markup with your little bits of Alpine syntax in them here and there, similar to what we've seen in the previous uh, examples. Let's take a look at our app, our app.js file. Oh, that's one other difference in this one. I'm including Alpine and I'm including that app.js file after it, of course, too. And here's my app.js file. A little bit of boilerplate JavaScript stuff. When Alpine starts up, it will broadcast the event Alpine colon init, letting the browser know, hey, I'm loading. This is similar to your jQuery document dot ready kind of thing. And then inside there, you say Alpine dot data instead of x dash data. I put the name of my component in there, the app, which is what we had here. That's how those get linked together. And then I just have my variable stored here in JavaScript instead of being in my actual div tag over on the other file, like we saw in the previous examples. And then those all work here the way we expect them to. Guitar, vocals, bass, drums, model guitar, model vocals, model bass and drums. Um, and just to make this one a little bit fancier, I wrap these div tags in X show logic. It says if the guitar, that way if guitar length is empty, don't display the guitar thing on the screen. And I did the same thing for vocal space and drums. So if I load that up, you can see that when all four of these form fields have stuff in them, all four of the plain text versions appear on the screen. But if I go in here and I get rid of vocals, the vocals line up above goes away too. And the same thing would be true for anything else in there. And then I can come back and add new vocals in here. David Bowie. And it will pop back up on the screen just to have a little bit more fun interactivity in this particular demo. <clears throat> So what about this xcloak thing? Um, similar to jQuery, you've got the jQuery document.ready thing because you want to make sure that you don't run any jQuery until after jQuery itself has fully loaded up and initialized in your browser and everything's ready to go. Then you want your code to run. Um, if you have an app with maybe poorly written jQuery in it or just a lot of HTML and a lot of maybe you know different varieties of high or low quality JavaScript. Sometimes you have those situations where like part of your web page will show up on the screen before the jQuery ha has had a chance to hide that div. So you get that weird like flicker of something shows up for, you know, hundred milliseconds and then it vanishes and then your app is ready to go. To get rid of that, um, you know, that kind of just unprofessional look of how things happen um, in some situations with lots of code or slow browsers or whatever, Alpine has added this xcloak thing. And what that tells us is since this Alpine component is, I don't know, four, 30 some lines of code long, depending on how you want to count my white space. Um, it's possible that when I first load this up, it might flicker on the screen for a brief second before everything is actually loaded by Alpine and ready to go. Um, if you add xcloak onto your component and in your CSS file, you add this syntax, that will tell Alpine, do not draw any of this stuff on the screen until Alpine itself has fully initialized and is ready to go. So you'll see that my CSS for xcloak is just saying, you know, don't display this on the screen until it's ready to go. That And that's all I have to do. I, I simply add xcloak here. There's no JavaScript for this. There's no config option I had to turn on. I put xcloak there, and then I have to manually add that line of code to my CSS. I could have other CSS in here too for all the other tags on the screen if I wanted to. I just don't have any for this particular demo. So there's only the one line uh, for this um, purpose. <clears throat> but if I go back here and load that up in the browser, you can see it on the screen, right? So Alpine has in fact loaded. If I go right click and inspect, you'll notice that on my div tag, xcloak is gone. It's not actually there anymore. When Alpine loaded the app up and got everything initialized, it took the xcloak attribute off of my div tag and displayed everything on the screen. All right, so there's, we have separate JS and HTML files now. Um, 
getting some good stuff ready here. Uh, so multiple Alpine components. Um, you can have more than one X data thing on the page. You're not limited to just one. Um, just give them all different names, like X data the app for this one. And if I had a different div tag or paragraph tag or something else later on down the page, don't call it the app, call it something else like menu bar or favorite color or whatever, as long as they don't conflict. You can have as many different Alpine components on the screen as you want to have. Remember, these aren't really full-blown apps like Vue or React or anything. These are components. They're similar in functionality scope to something like an HTML web component, which is just plain JavaScript in a self-contained class file. Components in Alpine work more closely to that kind of thing or like a Vue component, not so much a whole-blown Vue 3 app or a React app. Um, getting that difference in my head, you know, was a really big help in kind of figuring out how some of the other more advanced features in Alpine actually worked. Um, <clears throat> so because each component is its own thing and each component has its own X data, they're sort of self-contained and the X data variables in one, let's say div tag, cannot talk to the X data variables in some other X data div tag that are doing different things. Um, you can dispatch messages like you can with vanilla JavaScript where you say, you know, um, you have event listeners and, and things that broadcast messages like on click or mouse over or whatever. You can do the same thing in um, Alpine syntax. This is the page that will show you how some of that syntax works. I'm not going to go into it super deeply today because it's just, it's kind of its own thing, but you can see it basically looks like this. I have like a div tag and um, I have a notify event, like when notify gets broadcast or dispatched, run this alert. And then inside there, I have a button that says, okay, when this button is clicked, dispatch the notify event out. And then that would run this code here. Yay, like that. Same kind of thing down here with, you know, um, you can actually pass in new data into the message that gets dispatched. So I can say dispatch and then just the name of the event, notify, at notify. And then here I can say dispatch a notify message that's up here and also send it this thing called message. And then you get it inside this special Alpine variable called dollar sign event and you get dot detail dot message to get these details inside that message and you can customize your messages and do other stuff with it. And we could kind of go down a little bit of a rabbit hole showing you how to do different dispatching stuff in Alpine. So I'm not going to cover those details uh, here today, but maybe I'll put another video together for that later on and throw it on the South of Shasta YouTube channel or something. Um, if you do have multiple Alpine components on the page and you want to be able to pass data from one to the other, like you have global preferences, like if the user has selected dark mode on the page, you want to know that all five of your Alpine components need to be in dark mode, you know, settings for that or whatever. You can use, um, Alpine has a data store for global storage, stuff like that. You can use alpine.store to cover um, that sort of thing too. <clears throat> and again, that's got a few different options in it. We could go, um, you know, do a whole video just on some of the Alpine store stuff. Not that Alpine store or dispatching messages is complicated. You can start using it just a little bit, but um, I figured I just would save the fancy stuff like that for separate discussions. But wait, there's even more. Uh, you can also do CSS transitions in Alpine. Um, you just have a thing called X transition that you put on your um, your tag or your component rather. And a real quick look at it. These are the Alpine doc, um, docs, by the way, alpinejs.dev. Um, the easiest way to use it is like that, or just wherever you have an X show, since X show is doing the CSS thing where it just says display none. If you have X show and X transition on the same uh, element, that makes it really easy to do transitions like that. I don't know if you can see that well over Zoom, but when I toggle that on, it sort of fades in over whatever the default number of milliseconds is. I think it's 250 or 500. Um, it does that little transition state for you there. Uh, that being said, just because you can do something does not always mean you should do something. Um, this little Hello World demo here is not terribly invasive, but sometimes designers and marketing teams and what have you like to go really crazy with the CSS transitions and make it so that when you click a button, a whole big giant thing happens over the course of a few seconds, which at one, you know, at one glance or two glances in a meeting seems like it's a rad idea, but um, your users could very well get frustrated with that sort of thing very quickly. So please keep that in mind. If you start doing weird CSS transition things, all the same design rules and rules about not annoying your customers apply when doing them in 
Alpine, like they apply everywhere else. Uh, there's another thing in Alpine that could be its own um, presentation called magics. That's actually their word for it. Magics all look like this. It's a dollar sign. And then there's a handful or so of keywords after it. And they do other magic stuff in Alpine. Uh, like you have one for watching properties in your component. First name, last name, favorite color. And when those properties change, run some code. It's like here's a real quick example of my Alpine init method. And so there I want to say, just go watch for the property first name. And anytime first name gets changed from one value to another, go ahead and run some code for me. You can do whatever you want with that. Real similar to watchers in like Angular and other stuff. Uh, you have a magic for dispatching browser events. Here's the shorthand syntax that I do not like, but it fits on the screen pretty well. Button at click, and then just do dispatch, a notify message, and pass in the message, you know, syntax like that. We saw this in the previous uh, look at the documentation a minute ago too. So, and there are a handful of other magics that are neat to do stuff with too. They're down here in this section. You have one for elements, one for the store stuff. Next tick, getting the root element of something, a few other things that are um, useful as well. Uh, we talked about the Alpine store a little bit. Um, that's your global data store kind of thing for passing data from one component to another. Like I mentioned, there are other magics that are um, or could be useful depending on what you're trying to do. You can uh, use, there are plugins available for Alpine and you can write other plugins for it. There's other act, uh, advanced things like reactivity and you can extend Alpine.js. You can do async stuff with it, plus various other things. Uh, the documentation for all of that is here at alpinejs.dev. It's nice that the entirety of Alpine.js is not so terribly big and thick that going through the documentation feels exhausting. Um, everything is here on this one page. There's not even like page links below that or anything. Everything I need is um, one screen worth. Let's see, I can see directives down to XID. And then if I scroll all the way to the bottom, XID is still on the screen. So not even two screens worth of stuff in the bookmarks on the left-hand side there. And by no means do you need most of this to build an app. You can build an app using just X data and maybe a couple of X if or X show commands and that might very well be all you need to do with your Alpine.js uh, component. <clears throat> Some other good places to learn more about Alpine.js if you want to check things out. Uh, Raymond Camden is a guy. He's currently a developer evangelist for Adobe, um, but he has a blog, RaymondCamden.com, where he blogs about web components, Alpine.js, how to do rad Adobe PDF stuff. Uh, he used to work in the cold fusion space a lot, so he's got some cold fusion stuff up there, I think. And a whole bunch of other fun things. But yeah, there's probably a good 20 or 25 blog posts on Ray's uh, website about Alpine.js stuff that's worth checking out. Of course, the docs that we saw a minute ago, and this particular page here is worth um, checking out too once you've covered the basics of it and you feel like, okay, I, I think I know what I want to you know, start doing with Alpine.js. Check out this components page because that will actually show you um, some of the component libraries that are already here too for doing things like accordions and, you know, um, notification messages and tabs and all the other usual stuff that people have to do when using like a bootstrap library or, a you know, going way down the jQuery, jQuery mobile route or whatever the stuff is you happen to be using. Um, there is a paid set of Alpine UI components that you can just buy. Um, it solves a lot of the standard things we usually have to solve when building out a new component library for whatever the app is. Sometimes people get turned off at the idea of like paying for code when it, the first main thing was an open source free Alpine JS file. Why am I paying for this next thing? Well, look at it this way. If these will solve problems for you, think about what your hourly rate is for writing code and how many hours would it take you to solve all of the problems this library solves. Multiply that number times your hourly rate. I'm going to bet you're going to be paying a lot more than 129 bucks to rebuild all that stuff from scratch just to have it yourself. This is kind of a no-brainer if uh, this component library would, you know, solve a bunch of problems for you. And then you're giving back to the guy that wrote Alpine.js too. That's another nice thing about this library. Alpine was not written by a company. Um, it's similar to Vue in that regard as well. And that like Vue was started by that one guy whose name I can't think of at the moment. Um, Alpine was just written by this one person. And for the most part, uh, his name is Caleb something. Um, he's the main... Uh, the main person maintaining the entire Alpine thing. So it's not like you're giving money to a giant corporation or whatever. You're helping the person who developed the stuff. 
Uh, there is an official Discord as well, if you're into the Discord thing. They still have a Twitter account. I checked it the other day. They do, they slash he, Caleb, do post, uh, you know, semi-regularly. And then, of course, I run my developer consultancy business. We have a one-day Alpine JS training course. Uh, if you'd like to book time and just have somebody, you know, either be in person or over Zoom for a few hours and, and walk you through how to build stuff using nothing but Alpine JS, we offer that as um, one of the consulting services at my company. And those are ways to reach me if you have questions about anything. Uh, like I said at the beginning, that's my GitHub. It's not visible, it's not public right now, but after this presentation is done, I'll turn the repo on live so that uh, everyone can see it and download all the code and slides from today's talk. With that, I'm going to stop sharing and see if there are any questions. All right, nothing in the chat. Uh, if you have a question about anything you saw, please feel free to unmute your microphone and ask away. Is there one or two uh, favorite uses for it? I'm just trying to think how I would use it. In favorite uses for AlpineJS. Uh, so the common example I see that's a little bit more involved than a hello world thing is people like them for like search and filter functionality. Like if you need to add maybe pagination to a bunch of results, you could use, write a, an Alpine page to do that or the search box itself and then filter down the results that show up based on what people type into the search box. Um, Things like that would be um, where I would start with it. Uh, you can also do like maybe um, some basic front end form validation with it just to make, you know, a little more of a customized UX for uh, JavaScript um, form validation stuff. But yeah, usually uh, search stuff or pagination is where people start with it, in my experience. Does that help, Angus? Yeah, thanks. Okay, cool. You're very welcome. Um, anybody else? All right, good. I'm going to take the lack of questions as you're all blown away by Alpine JS and it looks easy to use and you're going to grab the files and start checking it out for your next project. Um, if uh, you're interested in joining us next month for Second Interactive, please do. It'll be third Wednesday of the month, again, 6.30 p.m. here on Zoom. Just go to sacinteractive.com, uh, sign up for the mailing list, or just message us on Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn, and we'll uh, get you on the list uh, to let you know what's going on. Next month, we have, oh, what is it? It's talk about um, social media and marketing and that sort of thing. I'm blanking on the exact title of the talk, but it's stuff related to that end of web development and moving your projects forward more from like a marketing SEO social media perspective should be a good talk. Uh, so thanks everyone for joining us. I'm going to go ahead and turn the recording off uh, and I'll see you all next month. Have a good night.